What does it mean to be provided for? To have food on the table, good company by your side, perhaps the ability to depend on and lean into someone else, to let down one's guard and to be held and helped, cherished but challenged. We see story after story throughout scripture of God's provision, meeting people where they are and changing everything. But those glimpses, those change everything about everything moments that knowing Jesus unlocks, they're woven into our stories too. Threaded when in distress, we must desperately depend on God. Bound in those crucibles that require our mindful commitment to boldly believe the real food and nourishment offered us is indeed better than anything else. Thankfully, our good God gave us generously His Spirit to help with the realignment process, to throw out our resource roadmap in exchange for His. So what does provision look like in our lives? Friend, you are in for a treat. Welcome, everybody, to the last episode in this season called Provision in our big series we're talking about from head to leb, how you and I can experience the presence of God living in and through us. Now, as we've been moving through the Gospel of John, you probably have noticed that there are some things that Jesus says sometimes that are really hard to understand. And in this particular season, he has said some very strange things like this. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. Now, Jesus spoke other words very similar that were also really hard to understand, like these words. He said, I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. Now, when you put those words together, is Jesus saying that the very life of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lives in him, and that if we eat his flesh and drink his blood, that somehow our lives will be infused with that same divine presence? Now, if you are a follower of Christ and you really believe in him, that is a challenging statement, and it kind of evokes a question that I'd like to leave with you, and that question is this. Is it really possible for you and me to become infused with the immortal presence and power of the one who created the universe and lives forever? Now, that is a big question, so let me just say it again, all right? Or ask it again. Is it really possible for you and me to become infused with the immortal presence and power of the one who created the universe and lives forever? Now, I think I know the answer to that question, at least as a follower of Christ. And the answer is, yes, it is possible. But if it's possible, that should shake our lives up, shouldn't it? It should cause us who are followers of Christ to never, ever be the same again. So what does that question mean to you? And do you really believe it? Do you really believe that God has said that and that God wants that for your life as well as for my life and for those of us who are part of the church, for his church? To be infused with his immortal presence and power, his living spirit at work in our lives. Well, let me tell you what happened after Jesus presented these kinds of ideas to his followers. A lot of them quit. That's right, there was like this mass resignation because they just couldn't understand what he was talking about and they just couldn't accept it. In fact, it tells us in John chapter 6 that many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And then Jesus said, will you also desert me? Will you also turn away? He was talking to his disciples, his 12 closest disciples. 
and wanted to know if they were still in with him or if they also were on the way out. And it's such a relevant question for you and for me in our time. Are we in? Are we on the team? Do we really want to follow Jesus? Do we want to accept these things that he says that sometimes are really hard to understand? Are we willing to embrace them into our lives? You know, there are a lot of people today that struggle with the words of Jesus. In fact, I was reading a blog recently by a guy by the name of uh, Adam uh, Jeske, and he talked about some of the reasons why some people might hate the idea of following Jesus. He said one of the reasons is because Jesus commands us to love all sorts, all sorts of people. And some folks struggle with that. I mean, do I really have to love my enemy? If I'm a Democrat, do I have to love a Republican? If I'm a Republican, do I have to love a Democrat or an independent or a socialist? (laughs) Do I have to love people who are white or black or brown or any other hue and color? Do I have to love people from that place in the world or this place in the world? Do I have to love my ex? Jesus says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And God expects us to also love this world. And it's not an easy world to love. And he said, you know what? It's one thing just to love your friends. But he said, the true mark of a Christian is you can love your enemies as well. And some people just wrestle over that. Another reason why some people hate the idea of following Jesus is because he's so exclusive. That is, he does love everybody, but he's pretty exclusive about who can follow him. And he gives us the freedom and the right to say, you may love me, God, but I don't love you enough to actually follow everything that you say. And so some people just kind of resign and walk away and they say, I really don't want anything to do with the Jesus who is that exclusive. Like when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to Father but through me. That's pretty exclusive. Why can't I just pick and choose what Jesus says that I agree with and live that way? Why, why does that have to be the only way? Does that mean a good Buddhist or a good Hindu or a good Muslim or some other philosophy or religion? Does that mean they're not going to get in? And then, I mean, Jesus was pretty exclusive about the issue of sexuality or the issue of marriage. I mean, he made it pretty clear that marriage is between a biological male and a biological female who commit to a lifelong relationship together. That's the only marriage. He was pretty exclusive about the practice and the joy of sex, that it has to happen within the confines of marriage and not in any other format or way. No hooking up, no other forms of sexuality. And some people just see that and read that and they just go, I can't follow that Jesus. Now, maybe I'll create a different kind of Jesus for myself, but I just, I can't do it. It's too exclusive. And some people struggle to follow Jesus and hate the idea of it actually because he demands that we surrender our whole self to him, everything to him. I can't keep part of it for myself. I can't say, Jesus, you can have this part, but this part is mine. He wants everything everything in our lives. It reminds me of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus one day and just wanted to ask, you know, what is the essence of having eternal life? And they had this long discussion. And after the discussion, Jesus said to him, look, go and sell everything you have and come follow me. What an invitation. Wouldn't you love to get that invitation? Hey, rich guy, go sell everything you have and I want you to be one of my followers. And it says that the man was sad because he could not and would not depart with his riches, and he walked away. And what's so interesting is that in Mark's gospel account of that man's life, it says that Jesus loved him. Even though he refused to walk and follow Jesus, Jesus still loved him. And it broke his heart that that man would desire more the material things of this world than the very bread of life himself. And so the big question for you and for me is, will we follow him? Do we want to go with Jesus? Or are we having second thoughts? Or are you having second thoughts about this idea of following Jesus? You know, Jesus kind of draws a line in the sand sometimes, doesn't he? And he doesn't allow much gray area or wiggle room. He doesn't allow any gray area or wiggle room. You're either for me or you're against me. You're either with me 
or you're not with me. And though I love the world, in order for you to experience the fullness of that love, you have to surrender to me. And it wasn't just the public that had a hard time with some of Jesus' words. Even his own family at first, his brothers, his half-brothers, didn't really believe in who he was. And so they were getting close to the time of a feast that we'll talk about in a little bit called the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was going to happen in Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus' brothers kind of harassed him a little bit, got kind of sarcastic with him. Listen to what they said there in John chapter 7. It says, But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters, or tabernacle, or feast. And Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. Hear the sarcasm? You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the whole world. They didn't believe in him at that point. They're kind of mocking him. And uh, Jesus says to them, you know, I'm not going to go right now. You guys go on ahead. Because the truth is, the the truth is, he says, the world He says, the world can't hate you, but it does hate me. And he tells us why. Because I accuse it of doing evil. Do you know why Christians are hated? Some Christians are hated around the world? Because they point out evil. Now, you can point out evil in a judgmental kind of, you know, I'm better than you are attitude. That's not what I'm talking about. But I mean, just the fact that we'll call something evil that the culture of the world wants to call good can cause hatred to come towards us. And there were plenty of people who hated Jesus. I mean, they really did not like him. In fact, there in Jerusalem at the Feast of the Tabernacles, all right, there were Pharisees who were running around asking people if they had seen Jesus or knew where he was. Do you know why? Not because they want to have a friendly chat with him, but because they wanted to get rid of him. They didn't like him. In fact, the public was kind of divided over Jesus. There were some who considered him to be this huge fraud. And there were others that thought, no, I I think he's the real deal. But nobody really wanted to come right out and say he is the son of God. They had to be really careful of that because back in those days, you could be ostracized from society by one of those Pharisees. I mean, religion ruled all of life. And so people are kind of careful with what they said or how they inferred certain things. Well, Jesus ends up going to that festival. And uh, he goes kind of quietly because of all the chaos around him. But about halfway through it, he couldn't take it anymore. He had to speak. And so he goes to the temple And he begins to preach. And I want you to listen to what he says. This is out of John chapter 7, verse 28. He says, Yes, you know me. And you know where I come from. But I'm not here on my own. The one who sent me is true. And you don't know him. But I know him because I come from him. And he sent me to you. But Jesus told them, I will be with you only a little longer Then I will return to the one who sent me. You will search for me, but not find me. And you cannot go where I am going. And that's why they hated Jesus. Because of this association that he had with the Father, calling himself the Son of God. Claiming to have this unique, special relationship with God himself. Pointing to himself as the the means of salvation. The religious leaders didn't need a savior. They already had one. His name was Moses and the law. And that's what they gave their lives to. The only Messiah they needed was one to liberate them politically, not spiritually. They had the system down of what it meant to walk with God and follow God. It was by keeping the law and making the sacrifices. And they controlled that system. And Jesus was threatening that system by drawing everybody's attention to himself. Well, finally, at about the last day of that great feast, Jesus erupted again with a grand announcement. Now, before I tell you about that announcement, let me tell you about the Feast of the Tabernacles, all right? It was a uh, time when the Jews would literally leave their homes 
and they would set up these little lean-tos, like these little tents, these little shacks, and they would, they would stay in there for about eight days. And they would commemorate the time that their ancestors spent in the wilderness between Egypt where they had been enslaved and the promised land that they were moving towards. And they would celebrate and recount it with their families and their friends. And they would talk about how God provided the manna, you know, in the morning, their food to eat. And there in the wilderness, how God even provided water out of a rock that split in two. During that period of time, they also had a celebration that happened every day. One of the priests would take a golden pitcher and he would lead this processional down from the temple to the pool of Siloam. And there he would dip the, the pitcher in the water and then they'd make their way back up to the temple courts to the altar where the sacrifices were made. People would gather around the altar and a choir would sing from Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. And they would sing something like this. We will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. We will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation as he poured it out. Now, I don't know if what Jesus said happened as the priest was climbing the ramp to pour the water out on the altar or if it happened right afterwards. But Jesus exclaims these words. You can hear it just echoing out as he catches everybody's attention. Here's what he says. He says, on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Now what does Jesus mean when he shouts out, if you're thirsty, come to me and I will give you the living water. I'll give you the living bread. I'll give you the living water. What does Jesus mean by that? Literally what he's saying to them is, look, you know, you guys think about the Old Testament, how God brought water out of a rock. I am the spiritual rock. And God is going to bring out of me salvation. And I want you to come and I want you to drink me in. I remember years ago when I had my first anaphylactic reaction. I have a strange allergy I've told you about before to uh, exercising and eating nuts in proximity to each other. I mean, it, it can take me out, okay? I have to carry EpiPen with me, especially when I'm exercising. Uh, I'm usually okay, but I've only had, only, I think I've had three episodes because either I ate some nuts or someone didn't tell me there were nuts in something. But anyway, I remember the first time Marsha brought me into the ER I had been outside running and exercising. I was so dehydrated. I was starting to go in shock. They laid me on the gurney and they started pumping me full of epinephrine and some other drugs. And then they hooked up this, this bag, the saline solution, and, and put it into my, my vein. And I'm telling you what, it was the most amazing experience. Like I could feel myself like coming to life again. I could feel that cool liquid. It's like I could feel it circulating in my body. I was getting hydrated again. It had an amazing effect. Or a couple of years ago, I started doing uh, century rides, 100-mile bike rides. And, and I read up on it, and my son-in-law, who's a physician, told me how to prepare for it. He's a great bike. Uh, he's a great cyclist as well. Uh, I shouldn't say as well. He's a great cyclist. I am not. Um, but he told me, take coconut water with you, all right? So I would get coconut water, and I'd have that with me, and I'd take some high-protein, high-carbs with me, and I'd get out there, and I'd just be pedaling on a hot day, going 10, 15, or 20 miles, and then I could just feel my energy going down, 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 down. I mean, like, to a point of, I don't feel very good right now. I don't know if I can continue. Maybe I'll just stop at 20 miles, get off my bike, chug down some coconut water, start to eat those, those uh, protein and carb bars, and I get back on my bike, and it was just amazing how all of a sudden I would feel so revitalized. It, it was like my tank was filled up, and I could go another stretch before I'd have to take it again. The reason I'm telling you about all that, because I'm sure you've experienced it too, is that just as physical nutrition can re-energize and refuel your body, 
God says he wants to do something. He wants to infuse you with a spiritual energy, literally his spirit, to re-energize your life and my life. And yet a lot of us go through our lives, don't we? Tired. I'm not talking about physical tiredness as much as spiritually tired, discouraged, and apathetic. Either the Holy Spirit doesn't exist and doesn't live in us, or we are not attuned to his presence. And we're not responding to his presence in our lives. And I think that's the case. And so this excitement, at least in me, of being able to know his presence and experience his presence. Tim Keller asks a a kind of a profound question. And the question he asks is, you know, what does it really mean uh, to be a, a Christian? And I love this answer. Here's what he says, okay? He says, it's the direct expression, all right, of God's lifeblood, his substance, his spirit penetrating, and I added, and filling you up. So what's the essence of Christianity? What is the essence of what it means to be a Christian? Is to have the direct presence of God penetrating my life, his spirit, and filling me up. Do you know that presence in your life? Are you aware, are you attuned to the Spirit's presence in your life? Listen, here's what Peter wrote. Peter says, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share, look, his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. You and I have been invited by Jesus to share that divine nature of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and and the experience that Jesus knows as being the Son of God, of being very God, can come into your life and mine. Paul put it this way. Paul said, the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by his same Spirit living within you. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba or Daddy Father. Wow. When was the spirit given to you and me? Well, the scriptures tell us he was given to us when Jesus was glorified, which then raises the the question, well, when was Jesus glorified? Well, listen to John chapter 13. As soon as Judas left the room, this is the upper room, it says, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son and he will do it at once. So when Jesus was glorified, that's when the release came for the Spirit to be able to come into the followers of Jesus. So when Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the tomb, that's when the rock was split open, so to speak. And there in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, the Spirit came and he's been coming ever since into the hearts and lives of those who trust the Lord. There's a beautiful picture of this in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 17. The people are in the wilderness wandering period and they come to a place called Rephidim. And when they get there, they are, they're dying of thirst. They're so thirsty. And they cry out to Moses, and Moses cries out to God. And I want you to listen very carefully, because it's a beautiful illustration. Listen very carefully to what God says to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, And call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will 
stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Now, I want you to look at that verse carefully because the instruction that God gives to Moses is this. He says, I, God, will stand before you on the rock and you're to strike the rock. So there's this kind of a picture as though Moses takes his staff and strikes God because God is on the rock. And out comes the water for the people to drink. It's a beautiful picture of God being the one who provides the water. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that Jesus is our spiritual rock. And Jesus was struck. He was struck on the cross. And when I first thought about that, I thought, yes, he was struck by our sins. And I realized, no, he was struck by his father. His father ordained that he would go to the cross. It is his father who abandoned him on the cross, who allowed him to be put to death. The father strikes the son. Remember when Abraham has the knife over his son Isaac and he's going to plunge it in Isaac and God tells him to stop and God provides a ram to do it instead. And he says, now I know that you're loyal to me, that you love me, Abraham. It was a picture of what God was going to do with his son. That on the cross, God would follow all the way through and allow his son to die for our sins. And when Jesus died on the cross, what flowed out of him? Grace, mercy, forgiveness, love, compassion. Remember his words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And of course, anybody who puts their faith in him receives then the inflow of all of that in the form of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. So what does it take for you and me to know this infilling, this presence of God in our life? Well, first of all, we have got to believe and not just mentally believe. I mean, the the Pharisees believed in God. And they also, by the way, (coughs) believed and knew that they were sinners. But the problem of the Pharisees was this. They also believed that their works, their own righteousness was good enough. So for them, it was, God, I believe in you and I deserve to get into heaven because of what I've done. It's one thing to say mentally, I believe in God. But the second thing that's important is I also must thirst I must thirst for God. And the only way a person can thirst is you have to become aware of your emptiness. And so I have found in my life that the secret, the essence, to truly and sincerely experiencing the presence of God is to realize two things at once. One, to realize this emptiness and this thirst. And two, to realize this infilling this quenching of my thirst. And the best way I can illustrate it is, remember a time when you've been really, really thirsty? I mean parched. And you got the bottle of Gatorade or you got, the, you got the water fountain and you started to drink it in. Two things happened at once, right? Your thirst was driving you to suck that water in. But as the water went in, the sensation, the quenching of your thirst, oh, it was so pleasurable. It was so good. And that's to be the picture, I think, of the Christian life. Aware of the thirst, aware of the emptiness, and the pleasure and the joy of drinking in God's grace and God's goodness and God's joy into our lives. Which raises the question, the question is this, how do you know when somebody's there? What is the evidence in somebody's life that they're, drinking in God's presence, that that God is filling their life up. And uh, I came up with a couple of things that 
came by way of study and what other people said and just some things that I thought of myself that I think are, are real markers of this. For instance, I'm convinced that one of the evidences of somebody who's truly experienced the fullness of God's spirit in their life is that they don't see themselves as victims. We have a lot of that in our world today. Everybody's a victim. But somebody who's filled with the Spirit of God, they just don't see themselves as victims because they know what God has done for them. They know that God lives in them and they're so satisfied with that. Secondly, they don't focus on the problems. Now, I didn't say they didn't have problems. I've got them. I'm sure you do too. But they don't focus on them. They don't let their problems take over their life because greater is he that is in me, right, than he that is in their world. And they're not filled with self-pity. They're not filled with self-pity. They can't be filled with self-pity because they realize how good God has been to them and they need less affirmation. We all need it to some degree, but they just don't need so much affirmation because they have the affirmation of Abba, how much he loves them. And they have a sense of living in freedom even though they may be imprisoned in illness or imprisoned in financial difficulties or other kinds of challenges, they still have that tremendous sense of freedom in their spirit. And the last thing I wrote down is they live with such a generous spirit. They are so generous. Because they've been given so much, they can't keep it. They have to give it back and give it away. And so while I was thinking about this, I thought to myself, you know, there's one more way to find out what's really flowing through my veins. And that is strike me. Yeah. I'm not saying necessarily physically, but strike me emotionally. Strike me with words. Strike me with difficult circumstances. Strike me with illness and see what comes out. And a lot of times what comes out of me is pretty ugly. I gotta be honest with you. It is pretty ugly. It does not give evidence to the presence of God. It gives evidence to an angry individual. It gives evidence to a carnal person. When you're struck by words or by difficulties or by illness or by challenges, what comes out? If we think of ourselves as a church, as the body of Christ, when we're struck with challenges and difficulties, whether it's the pandemic or you know, political problems or social unrest or whatever it is the world throws at us. What comes out of us? These last couple of years, some awful things have come out of the church. Awful negativity, awful criticism, hatred. The church is struggling these days because we're not filled with the Spirit as individuals. We're not bleeding the compassion, love, and grace of God We're forgetting about how blessed we are. And therefore, we cannot gush forth his grace, his compassion, his mercy. And that's why on this Commitment Sunday, in our Legacy of Hope vision, we're asking you to join together, to join me, to join us, to be the kind of people and the kind of church that when when life strikes us, so to speak, when hard times come or God allows us to go through a valley, that what gushes out of us isn't criticism, isn't anger, isn't meanness, isn't name calling, isn't negativity, isn't politics, isn't prejudice. But what comes out of us is the love of God. The love of God, the compassion of God, the grace of God, the truth of God because that's what this world so desperately needs. And that's what leaving a legacy of hope is all about. I'm inviting you to join us in bringing to the world around us the 300,000 families around our immediate campuses, bringing to them the hope of God's love, the hope of God's truth and God's grace. I wanna invite you to join me in providing an innovative hope to the region that's around us. Those of you who are joining us online, out in other parts of the world or across the country, and you consider us to be, you know, your church. That wouldn't happen if it wasn't for some innovation that we're doing here. We want you to be part of that as we try to reach even more. And we want you to be part of our exponential hope 
We want to plant 30,000 churches in the next 10 years in a part of the world in Asia where less than 1% of the people know Christ. There's a region where there are 300,000 villages left. We'd like to own, we'd like to own 10% of those villages and bring them the gospel. Do you see only men and women and boys and girls and young people who are filled with the Spirit, who know what they have, can give back, can gush forth, so to speak, with the love and the grace of God. And I pray that that's what's going to happen at all of our campuses and those of you who are joining us online. At this point, I'm going to hand it off to someone who's going to explain to you what you can practically do next. And I look forward to you as we begin our next season, next weekend, we're going to be talking about how God heals our lives.